Welcome to a new lecture of conformal diagrams in general relativity. In previous lecture, we studied the conformal diagram of Minkowski spacetime, and today we are going to carry out with the study of the conformal diagrams of the Sitter spacetime and anti Sitter spacetime. Well, these three spacetimes belong to the simplest possible solution of the Einstein field equations. And I would like to start this lecture to, by explaining why those spacetimes are the simplest solutions, and in a sense, why I mean by the simplest solutions. To do that, I need to remind you of a concept of differential geometry, which is the notion of sectional curvature. What is the sectional curvature? Okay, let that, well, suppose we, we have a pseudo Riemannian manifold, it can be uh, space time, and let us take two vector fields. I'm going to use this notation. Okay, so this, this uh, U and V are smooth vector fields defined on M. Then the sectional curvature is defined as follows. where the brackets are an abbreviation for the scalar product with respect to the metric. Okay. Right. So, well, the sectional curvature has a clear geometric interpretation, which I'm not going to discuss here. But I, what I'm going to discuss is the case in which the sectional curvature is constant, which means that this scalar quantity is independent on the chosen smooth vector fields, okay? Right. When that happens, we say that our spacetime is a spacetime of constant sectional curvature. And the thing is that it's possible to classify this kind of space times. And this is what the following theorem shows.
ribbon tensor of a pseudo remaining manifold which is of constant sectional curvature has a very specific form. And this uh, K naught is a constant, which a simple computation shows that is the sectional curvature. Okay. Right. So, what is more? This uh, structure of the Riemann tensor also implies that the metric can be written in a very specific form in certain coordinates. where here eta mu nu is the flat metric, the flat pseudo Riemannian metric in Euclidean coordinates. Well, maybe I should write this uh, below. Okay, right, so, okay, uh, I'm, I'm not going to keep the proof of this result, which uh, can be found in a number of uh, textbooks, for example, uh, in Eisenhardt, well, in the very old classic book, Eisenhardt, I, think it's, well, I don't remember the, the year, but just, well, is. The title is Riemannian Geometry. There, for example, you can find a proof of this result. But anyway, for us, the important point is that we can use this expression of the metric to classify the sp space times which satisfy this property. And this is so because the classification comes according to the sign of the constant sectional curvature. Okay, so because we have explicitly here the sectional curvature in the expression of the metric, so we have three situations the case in which K0 is positive, the case in which K0 is zero, and the case in which K0 is negative. Okay. Okay. And in fact, well, if we pick this expression of, of the Riemann tensor and we compute the Ricci scalar, okay, first we have to compute Ricci tensor. 
it's a very simple computation well I think I, uh, I don't think I need to keep the details it's just I just going to give you the result okay and from here we get that the scalar curvature is proportional to the sectional curvature okay so we can classify the spaces according to the sign of the scalar curvature well <coughs> and, and so these three cases are the case in which uh, scalar curvature is positive and well this will correspond to the the Sitter solution the case in which the scalar curvature is zero which corresponds to uh, well just look at the expression of the Riemann tensor k not zero means the Riemann tensor is zero so this is the Minkowski solution which we have already studied and then we have the case in which scalar curvature is negative and this is the anti -the sitter solution okay and why I keep why do I keep saying that these are solutions of the Einstein equations well if this is also this has a very simple answer because if you just remember Einstein equations with cosmological constant and well we assume that we are in vacuum so energy momentum tensor is zero then well it, it, it's easy to see that uh, these equations are satisfied by these spaces because well we have here the expression of, of Ricci tensor and you, we have the expression of the scalar curvature so we are we see that w these, these equations are fulfilled for certain values of uh, of the cosmological constant lambda it's just a matter of doing a simple replacement I think I will just write everything in terms of K naught. Okay, so this is uh, This means that if we just pick up, uh, well, sorry, this is with a plus. So we just pick up uh, lambda equal to three times k naught. Then we see that uh, spaces, spaces with constant sectional curvature are a solution of the vacuum Einstein equations with cosmological constant. And again, we have now the classification which I have just written but in terms of the cosmological constant so I could have I could just write this with the cosmological constant Well, of course, in this case, uh, this is just vacuum with zero cosmological constant, and this is with the negative cosmological constant. Okay, so the reason why I said that these are the simplest solutions of the Einstein equations is because these are these uh, these 
three spaces are spaces of constant sectional curvature and they fulfill the vacuum Einstein equations with cosmological constant, which in the case of Minkowski uh, is the cosmological constant equal to zero. Okay? Right. So this was just the mo geometric motivation for, for, the for the study of these three cases. We have already studied uh, Minkowski in, in, in the previous uh, lecture. And now in this lecture, we are going to study the sitter solution and anti sitter solution. Okay. Right. So let us start with the sitter solution. normally written small letters. Okay, well, previous theorem already gave us a form for the metric of uh, the Sitter solution, but, well, is in, there are a number of, of ways of getting this uh, metric. Here we are going to present uh, a way which is normally followed in textbooks, which is uh, maybe more intuitive than the metric which one gets from the previous theorem. And the way in which one can, well, it's, it's more intuitive because it enables us to visualize uh, the sitter space-time. And the way of, of getting the metric is just, okay, we are going to see the Sitter solution as a subset of uh, five-dimensional flat Minkowski space-time. Okay, so now let us just uh, consider five-dimensional uh, Minkowski, flat Minkowski space-time. And so let us define a subset of, 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 of this uh, L5 as follows. where here a is a constant um, okay maybe I just read it. it's a real constant and well this can be well this is uh, well if, if you remember the equation of a hyperboloid in lower dimensions you you recognize here that this is just uh, an, a hyperboloid but in five dimensions okay remember uh, the expression of the uh, hyperboloid, just a standard two-dimensional hyperboloid, right? And so this is uh, is the same, but now with more coordinates. So this is the very simple to understand that we are looking at an hyperboloid here. Um, well, but for our purposes, we need a metric in four dimensions. So we need to uh, find a, parameter, a parametrization of this hypersurface of L5 and then get the first fundamental form of this hypersurface because this first fundamental form will give us the four-dimensional metric which we need to perform our analysis, okay? And, well, it's just a matter of finding a convenient parametrization. I will write down the parametrization which we are going to use. So.
Okay. So this is the parameter section. And well, you may have immediately recognized that chi, theta, and phi are angles on the three sphere. This is because, well, the topology of this set, well, I, I mentioned a hyperboloid, but when you carry this out to higher dimensions, in this case of, or in, in, well, this hypersurface regarded as a set embedded in, in five dimensions, well, is a co-dimension one hypersurface and its topology is S3 cross R, okay? which is the topology of the theta space-time. Okay. Mm. Yes, and well, this is, it, it's just a, uh, one has to find the differentials of these expressions and plug them in, plug them in, in our original expression of flat five-dimensional Minkowski and this gives you the first fundamental form of this co-dimension one hypersurface. I'm not going to carry out the computation here. I've just showed you the result. And so this is the metric of the sitter space time. Well, in this expression, well, this is the metric of the round three sphere. And so, well, it's clear when we look at this expression why I'm saying that the topology of the sitter is R cross S3. Well, maybe this would get even clearer if we just look at a picture of the hyperboloid, right? I have already prepared a picture for you. Now it's a bit thick. I have to rescale the picture to make it smaller. Okay, here it is. Right, so, well, I cannot draw in four dimensions, so I have to drop two dimensions out in order to draw the picture. And, um, well, these circles uh, are hypersurface with t constant, so they have the topology of uh, S3, so they are the S3 part, and then we have the this uh, vertical, well, these lines with chi constant, which represent the R part of the topology. Okay. Um, yeah, well, yeah, just, I am saying that this is a, a quad dimension one hypersurface embedded in five dimensions. So just let me draw the five dimensional axis. 
Okay. And so, well, this hypersurface, this hyperboloid, represents gives us a visualization of the sitter space time. Okay. Right. And now, once we have this uh, vis visualization, we want to learn about the global causal structure of this solution. And so we will perform a similar procedure as the one we did for Minkowski space time, right? Remember what we did in the case of Minkowski space time. We found a conformal embedding of Minkowski space time into Einstein static universe. So next we are going to do something similar in the Tositer space time. Okay? Okay. Right. Well and so well let me just let us let us just take the metric which we have obtained. Okay. Let us put the metric here. And let us find a conformal embedding. Well, the procedure is similar to what we did for the case of Minkowski. So I'm not going to explain all the details we are going to do a number of coordinate transformations. Sorry. Oh. On this initial metric. And in the end, we will obtain an expression which will allow us to read off the conformal embedding. Okay, let us start. Well, uh, there's something which I forgot to say, and it's this, this, const this A, this is constant, and well, it's actually related to the cosmological constant. I don't think we need the explicit relation in this lecture, but just for the sake of completeness, let me just write that uh, A is equal to uh, over, okay, right. Okay, so let us just mm, carry out the transformations. Well, this is the first trans. Well, this the transformation that which we need. Well, it's actually uh, the inverse of this transformation because we are just doing, doing a transformation which involves only the coordinate t. Okay, so uh, okay, the inverse is just a very simple computation. Is just So, well, it's just a simple manipulation. Mm, I will not, mm, well, I'm just, perhaps I should just give an intermediate step. Uh, Let me just think. Mm. Okay, well, just have to take the differential of uh, this expression, put it here, and then do this replacement and do some uh, 
computations I just write an intermediate uh, result I encourage you to do the complete computation And here, well, I am adopting the, the um, okay, well, let me just do it a bit better, just because. I'm just adopting the standard abbreviation of naming the round, uh, three sphere the metric on the round three sphere by d omega three square so this is this and well it's just now playing a bit with the properties of the trigonometric functions to find the final result which is remarkably simple And again, we recognize here the Einstein static universe, okay? So it means that if we follow the procedure, we follow the reasoning which we did with the Einstein, with the, sorry, with the Minkowski space-time, we can construct an embedding such that uh, This corresponds to uh, the pullback of the original metric corresponds to this part, and which is the Einstein static universe. Okay, so it means that. Right, so, mm, okay, so we have the explicit conformal embedding of uh, the sitter space-time into the Einstein static universe, so we only need to find the conformal boundary, which is found just as we know by finding the zeros of the, of the conformal factor, which we define as the chi function. Here is easier than in the case of Minkowski because we have only one coordinate involved, which is the t. Okay. So Right? Okay, all very simple. Well, something, well, in, in fact, well, we, you, you see that there are uh, an infinite set of, of zeros, 
and well situation is sort of similar to the situation which we had in Minkowski where we had also an infinite uh, remember we had we had an infinite set of uh, lines of striped lines which represented the zeros of the chi function and but in the end we only needed to to, to pick a subset of of, those, of these zeros so here it, something similar happens so if we just draw picture okay maybe here perhaps i can just draw uh right um well okay uh again i am using chi for for the chi function and i'm using chi for for a coordinate for one of the uh coordinates on the round on the three sphere I hope that uh, there's no confusion. Well, you know, see that there's chi tilde, so there shouldn't be any confusion. But yes, and yeah, so we have And well, an, an, an infinite number of of, uh, of uh, lines. Well, and chi it's uh, varies between zero and uh, and pi. So we have to con just consider a particle line. Maybe I will just use a thinner pen draw this uh, line okay so yeah so that's what we have and then so we, we only need to care since Kai goes from we remember this restriction it means that we only need to care about uh, this set and also well we have to pick up one of the uh, regions which are between the horizontal lines so we just pick up the easiest one which is going to be this sorry let me just use again the thin pen okay Okay, and so this sort of uh, rectangle is going to represent uh, the sitter solution. But again, we need to think uh, this is a two-dimensional representation, but we need to work in 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 more than two di dimensions. We need to work in four dimensions, but as always, it's not possible to draw here from four dimensions. I can only, at most, I can just draw a two-dimensional representation of something which is three-dimensional so let us again take a picture of the Einstein static universe which is a cylinder which you know again I well, have to do the usual rescaling okay so here it is and we have to uh, take this uh, square and put it into the cylinder. Okay. Right. So, and well, this is what have been already done here, right? So, so you see here, it's just that. Well, if you remember that. T in the Einstein uh, cylinder goes from uh, goes along the axis of the cylinder. So so it's uh, and since we have that our region goes from t minus pi half to t equal to pi half. So so we just have to cut the cylinder at t equal minus pi half and t equal to pi half. And this is what I have done here. Um, this is the boundary, the conformal boundary, which is which well corresponds to these horizontal lines okay 
and yeah these uh, circles correspond to the s3 of the einstein of the, of the uh, einstein static universe which also in this case correspond to the uh, to the s3 of the uh, the sitter solution okay so yeah so you see here the this part of the cylinder is the image of the sitter under the conformal embedding. Sorry. Okay. Right. And again, you, you, you see here that the closure of sorry, the image is compact. So this is indeed a conformal compactification. And what else? Yeah, and, and, and well, I have drawn in red the conformal boundary. And in this case, well, it's just uh, two sets, which is uh, future uh, now infinity and past now infinity. And well, just by looking at the picture, we easily realize that the topology of each of them is just uh, S3. So in this case, we have a uh, conformal boundary appears to be simpler than in the case of Minkowski solution, okay? But what are the consequences of such a conformal boundary? What, what does this, what does this conformal boundary tell us about the global structure of the sitter solution. Well, let us discuss this now. Mm, okay, well, and for doing to that discussion, let us just take this rectangle and draw it a bit bigger. Okay. Well, basically what we need to do is just take this, this cylinder and unwrap it and put it in a two dimensional representation. So you just imagine that we take this, we open it up and we get uh, a rectangle. Right. So let's just drop this, uh, this rectangle. And um, okay, the vertical lines have some vertical lines here correspond to constant values of the chi coordinate. So we can say here that uh um yeah so so well um and then what well, it is just to remember okay Right, and well, what is the first important thing here? Well, this is similar to the case of Minkowski. You, you, we remember what null lines at look like in, in the Einstein cylinder. And so it, that enables us to draw here the null lines which are, again, lines with a 45 degree slope. Well, again, it's better to use the thinner pen just to get a nicer picture. Well, this should 
go from I'm just going to delete this part to make it nice because this just to, to keep the this is well it's not easy to draw 45 uh, degree slope but I think you can more or less imagine that okay sorry this was okay now this is one this is another one this is another one this is another one okay and so the knowledge of the null rays enables us to draw causal, cur causal curves inextensible causal curves for example i'm just going to draw an inextensible causal curve since the curve is causal its slope has to be between two null rays okay give another one and by doing that we notice that all inextensible causal curve and uh, start and end on the conformal boundary okay so you see that any inextensible causal curve has an endpoint has an endpoint on past now infinity and has an endpoint on future now infinity by the way here north and also another property uh, well we are using the the name uh, now just because uh, light rays are also null curves so are also causal curves and so the same applies to them well this well it might look like uh, well just remember that this this uh, line is identified with this line and so if we have a curve which has an endpoint here we have to just think that the curve continues on the other side okay so it's pretty much when like what happens when you project um, the uh, surface of the earth on the plane so we have uh, this goes here this uh, this continues on this side and then uh, these uh, null rays which you are seeing here also have endpoints at the uh, conformal boundary so that's why we're uh, using the, the the name null the point is that it now these uh, hyper these this, this, these are hypersurfaces on the Einstein uh, cylinder, and now it turns out that they are space-like hypersurfaces. Okay. Well, maybe. Okay, right. So, yeah, that's what we have. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and and the, and the fact that uh, these are space-like bring some. Uh, well, is somehow um, the reason why we have this uh, property that any uh, curve has an endpoint in future and past now infinity and any any causal curve and well there's there are also other consequences uh, of this property a property which we can see just by looking at the diagram is that for any Coastal inextensible curve. We have the following. Okay. And well, you remember from the previous lecture what the future and chronological past is. So it means that the future and chronological past of any causal inextensible curve is a, always a proper subset of the sitter. There are no causal curves such that the future 
or chronological past of it is the whole the sitter. Okay, this is not true. Okay, so well, you can, for example, well, uh, just I don't know, just pick this curve. Okay, then let me just uh, draw its uh, chronological uh, past. Well, just have to remember the definition of chronological past and just look at the curves representing the null race and you realize that it, it is the this shaded region represents uh, its chronological past and well I can also draw its chronological future well because well, you just have to think a bit about the definition of chronological past. So, so these are the set of points which can be reached from a point of, of, of the curve by means of a, a time-like uh, path. Okay, and so you s you just uh, look at this picture and see that not any point of uh, the sitter satisfies this property. Okay, and it's the same. Something similar happens with the chronological past. So, when this happens, we say we, we say that the particle gamma ha well, has a particle horizon, because well, the definition is as follows. We have well yes, in black. We have the following definitions. Okay. And so, uh, in in this uh, in in the sitter, this is always different from the empty set for any curve. This was not true in the case of Minkowski. Remember that there were uh, curves such that uh, this uh, set was the, the these sets were empty sets. Somehow we can well. If you just look at the diagram again and just um, see the, uh, just look a bit at, at uh, future null infinity and past null infinity, we see that we ha we see that they are uh, horizontal lines. They are space-like uh, hypersurfaces on the Einstein static universe, and the fact that they are space-like is responsible somehow for for this for the existence of these particle horizons. Remember that in Minkowski, these two were null hypersurfaces, and the very fact that they were null hypersurfaces implied that for some curves these sets were empty. Here, since these are space like, then for any curve these sets are non empty. Okay? And also, uh, we see that. Uh, and just by looking at this diagram, that it's possible to, to find Cauchy hypersurfaces. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to draw a hypersurface, call it sigma. And well, uh, I think it's already evident just from this picture that any causal inextendable curve in the picture will always have to meet sigma at some point. There is no way for a causal inextensible curve to avoid meeting sigma. Again, you have to bear in mind that this line and this line are identified, okay? So just by looking at the, the picture again, we can guess that uh, the sitter is globally hyperbolic.
So to summarize, we have uh, found that these uh, the diagrams uh, which we obtain, the conformal diagrams which we obtain uh, in Minkowski and the sitter have dif of different shape. In Minkowski, it was a triangle, sort of triangle. Here we have a kind of a square, and this has already brought some differences. For example, the existence of particle horizon for any uh, coastal inextensible curve, but still both Minkowski and the sitter are globally hyperbolic because we have found a Cauchy hypersurface, okay? So there are uh, mm, different properties, but uh, there are also similar properties. Well, another thing is that, mm, well, in, the, in this case of, of, uh, of the sitter, we have uh, been able to obtain the main information about the global uh, coastal structure by just studying a two-dimensional diagram. So, so in this case, when, when mm, this, this, uh, since the diagram is two-dimensional, we can, uh, well, I refer to the diagram as, as conformal diagram, but we can also use the name Penrose diagram. So I'll say uh, that this is the Penrose diagram of the sitter. Whenever we can uh, just uh, reduce uh, the study to two dimensions, we speak of, uh, we speak about Penrose diagram. Okay. Right. Well. Uh, and now. This is uh, the sitter. The next uh, case is anti the sitter. Well, we already mentioned that ADS is a space of conf negative curvature, negative constant sectional curvature, but as happens with uh, the sitter, there is an alternative representation of anti the sitter, which will help us to get a geometric picture of this space. And what is this geometric representation? Well, to show this representation, let us consider now again five-dimensional flat space-time, okay? But now it's not going to be flat Minkowski, it's going to be something a bit different. Mm, well, what notation should I... Uh, maybe uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think that probably the best is this notation. Okay, and why? What do I mean by this? Well, is flat space time with this, with the following line element. So, well, just notice this is not Minkowski because we have uh, we don't have Lorentzian signature. We have two coordinates playing the role of time. Okay, so in a sense, uh, uh, that's why I'm using this uh, notation to indicate that the signature is not Lorentzian signature; it's another signature. And well, it turns out that uh, ADS and Titus sitter in four dimensions can be regarded as a subset of this uh, space, which is defined as follows. So, okay. 
game this is going to be a condition on uh, the set of points which are are in in this space and the condition is the following one okay so well you you, you see that uh, this is a sort of hyperboloid but now it's not quite because we have two minus two minuses so we cannot say that this is hi uh, hyperboloid and well the point is that uh, if you have a set which uh, satisfies this condition on on r on 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 r5 because well uh, which is just uh, an element of r5 then it's not uh well it can be seen that the topology uh of of ad of this of this uh set is just uh s1 cross r3 well this is independent on mm, on the metric and just well forget the, forget about the metric just for a moment and just concentrate on this definition just the set of points of r5 such that uh, they satisfy this condition okay well this is enough to show that uh, the topology of this of of this set is given um, by this is, is s1 times r3 well when um, i mean i'm not going to give a formal proof of this but well one can uh, sort of guess that this is so because well you can just uh take um, the set of points such that uh, x1 plus x2 square so x, sorry x2 square plus x3 square is some uh, constant k okay then this means that uh, uh, x not square plus x4 square is um, is what is uh, minus a square uh, pl uh, minus a uh, square ma minus plus k square right and well uh, the topology of this uh, of this set okay for for a given value of of k uh, well of course one has to choose this uh, in such a way that uh, k that k square minus i uh, a square is positive okay so well and for for a value of k the topology of of this uh, set is just uh, s1 because this is the equation of a side of a circle in the plane x not x4 right so this accounts uh for the s1 which we have here and then if we vary the this constant what we get is a foliation of r3 by uh spheres because well this is for each value of k this is just the equation of a sphere so this accounts for the r3 right and this doesn't require any uh this doesn't require require that we have a metric in r5 at all okay well this is not a formal proof but it's just uh, uh an argument which makes uh, makes it plausible that one has this topology for this set without uh, appealing to the existence of a metric but anyway the the important thing is that well uh that it, is we need the metric and the thing is that if we uh find the first fundamental form of 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 this hypersurface embedded in this uh space we we will get something which is uh of course it's a, it's a four dimensional metric and this will correspond to the metric of ads4 
And how are we going to do that? Well, it's same as we did before with the, the sitter. It's just we need to find a parameterization. And well, the parameterization which uh, we are going to use is the following one. So, well, you'll see that uh, we are somehow adapting, uh, ad uh, we are finding adapted coordinates to uh, the S2, we, we have, sorry, the S1 we have here, and the uh, relation which, uh, ha which, which has a, a spherical symmetry, okay, because, well, so, so well, again, it's just, uh, simple computation to, to find the first fundamental form so you, we only need to differentiate each uh, of these uh, relations and replace them back uh, here in the expression of uh, the metric in dimension 5 right mm, well uh, well it's it's very easy if you well if you're familiar with uh, uh, ele but the elementary manipulations of differential geometry it's uh, well this is just going to give us the a spherical uh, line element in dimension three okay so uh, one has that x1 plus dx2 plus dx3 is equal to uh, dr plus r squared Okay, and, and as for this couple, it's just uh, computing the differentials, which is also, well, it's, it's a very simple computation and finding uh, the squares. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do the full computation. I'm just going to keep the result But I hope that you can carry out the computation yourselves. Okay. So that's what we have. And then, so we only need to put the two pieces together uh, and obtain the four dimensional metric. Well, uh, it's just uh, adding uh, these two terms and well, after some elementary algebra, you get I don't think you'll have much of much of a trouble to in, in getting this expression. Well, something uh, has happened here, and uh, is the following. And if if we just look at this uh, metric, well, we need to remember something important when here, and is that uh, the metric when we have a, a, a pseudo remaining manifold, okay? Well. The metric uh, doesn't determine the topology of, of, of the manifold, okay? So 
it just only gives uh well actually in in general the metric is just defined uh uh locally but it may happen that one has uh metrics with uh with well with one one has uh many faults with are with different topologies so so they are in fact uh different uh differentiable manifolds but they have the same metric okay well it's uh, very simple just in two dimensions we, we, with two dimensions just think about a plane and a cylinder okay so they are both uh flat they have both the flat um, two-dimensional metric but their topologies are different and something similar has happened here because we started with something uh whose topology is S1 cross R3 mm, and now we have found uh, well that the metric of this object is this thing and it turns out that uh, this metric uh, also may exist in a space whose topology is R4 okay so uh, in this case uh, well the, the well you can also guess that by looking at, at the expression of, of of the of the metric because well this part has topology r and this part has topology r3 because well this is just uh well is uh flat or well if 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 if, if this term w was absent then this could be just a uh, flat uh, Minkowski, fl what, sorry, flat uh, Euclidean uh, three-dimensional space. Uh, with this term in, well, this is still defined for uh, any value of, any positive value of R. So this is not introducing any change in the topology. So the topology of this space is R3. So we can regard this, uh, uh, this metric as a metric defined in a space of topology R4. So, uh, And so what has happened here? How, how it, it, we started from something which I said has topology R cross S3, and now we end up in something which has topology R4. Well, the reason why this is happening is, is because, uh, well, uh, this metric can be defined in, in, in our original uh, set with this topology, but it can also be defined in another manifold whose topology is R4. Well, we can visualize that if we just, uh, well, to a picture of this uh, set, okay? Well, we can just, I prepare the picture for you. So I'm just going to put it in. Okay, just give me a second. Okay, so here, is, here we have the picture. Let me just rescale it first. Okay. Okay. So yeah, one has to think. Uh, one, one has to imagine that uh, this is uh, that we are in in R in R five. I mean the, that this this is a picture in R five. Well, just to be more precise, this R five with this uh, strange signature. Okay. And now, well. As I said that this is a kind of hyperboloid in which, well, uh, X0 and X1 are playing the role of uh, of times. So, so, and yeah, it, it, I said that, um, well, in this, uh, that if you take uh, these sets, these sets have the, have the topology uh, S, S1. Let me just bring this uh, with me next to the picture. To make it more clear okay so so this has uh, uh, topology uh, s1 
and then we have the other part which is the uh, uh, r three topology so so in this in this picture this is represented uh, as follows so we have uh, these circles okay such that r uh, is constant well in this uh, representation uh, this uh, r is corresponds to this uh this uh to the, well, the, to this relation okay so r is constant and so uh in in the, they are they have the topology s1 so the, this circle each of these circles correspond to sets defined by this uh relation and then we have uh the uh t constant which are lines of uh, topology uh, R, okay. So, so this is, this has the topology uh, mm, R. So, if this was a is is so so th this is this uh mm, this in this representation we are seeing a two dimensional uh surface which has topology s1 cross r but well since this is a, a two-dimensional representation of a hypersurface in a space of five dimensions we need to add uh, two additional dim dimensions and so we get the topology s1 cross r3 which i mentioned before okay uh so but the situation is similar to the situation i explained before with respect to the uh flat space time and the cylinder so i said that flat space time could be defined on a, on a plane or an, on a cylinder and both are different manifolds because have different topologies but the metric uh, is the same and so here some mm, something is similar is happening we have to find we, we our metric or four dimensional metric in this uh, surface, which is embedded in five dimension space, in a five dimensional space, that it turns out that we can define also our metric on a uh, four dimensional uh, space, which has topology R4. And how do we go from this uh, space to the space with topology R4? Well, we do it's the same f as what we do to go from the cylinder to the plane we take the cylinder and unwrap the cylinder and get a plane so we take this uh sort of uh, hyperboloid and wrap it and get something which uh, is a, is a kind of plane okay and this something has the topology r4 and is where our metric is defined and from now, now on, we will regard anti the sitter as a space, as a four dimensional uh, space time with topology R4. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me just write this down. So, uh, Okay, 
So this is our chosen representation for untitled sitter, and we will work with uh, this uh, metric. Okay. Uh, well, uh, sorry, I, I just noticed there is a typo here because well, this capital T is not capital T, is small t, where small t is related to capital T as by means of our rescaling. So one has to, well, in addition, well, in addition to these coordinate changes, one has to do a rescaling of uh, T, of capital T. So one introduces small t by means of this relation. Okay, sorry, sorry about this mistake. Anyway, so this is our metric, and this is a metric in a space of topology R four. Okay, so this is all very beautiful, very nice, and yeah, well, you can check that uh, this is indeed a uh, mm, space of constant sectional curvature, it's just a computation. Well, you can also do that with, uh, the, sit with the expression of the metric of the sitter. I don't remember if I mentioned this previously, but the thing is that now that you have the metric, you can just take the metric and well, compute Riemann tensor, compute Ricci tensor, compute scalar curvature, and you get uh, all the properties which uh, a space of constant sectional curvature satisfies. In particular, you get that. Uh, well, let me just see. I have here the relation. Yeah. So, so in particular, if you just do the computation. You, you, you obtain that there is a relation between this constant small a and the cosmological constant you have in the Einstein equations. So it's just a computation which gives you this result. Okay, remember that in this case, cosmological constant is negative, right? Okay, so that's what, mm, well, that's the, uh, geometric uh, definition of anti sitter but what about its global structure? Well, to study it, its, its, global, uh, its global structure, its global causal structure, well, we do the conformal compactification. And like, well, procedure is again the same as for the Minkowski and the sitter. It's just doing uh, some um, coordinate transformations until we, uh, find an expression of the metric which enables us to construct the conformal embedding, okay? So, well, let me just mm, describe the uh, transformations. Well, let me just first take uh, the expression of uh, the metric for anti sitter and bring it uh, here. Okay, so that's what we have. And then, well, Uh, what we have to do is the following. Well, one can more or less guess what has to be done, but anyway, we shall do it. Okay, so this is the first transformation. Um, well, it's now just a computation and you find the expression of the metric in the new coordinates. just do a uh, rescaling of uh, T, okay? Well, uh, I am using again the, well, maybe, yeah, I have, uh, well, I, let me just go back a second. 
and well okay we, we are we are now in we are now coming back to uh, our original time capital T okay because we we just want to pull this constant way so that's why we introduced the rescaling as you probably have already guessed and so well we get well this is all very simple and you already recognize the Einstein static universe okay so so this is now the metric of the So, okay, you may all think that now things will proceed in a fashion similar to the previous cases. Well, there is some, uh, it, it, it is not, that, that's not quite true. We have to do something else and you will understand why in a minute. Because, okay, now we can, uh, once we have this, we can say, okay, uh, it, we can construct the conformal embedding of the sitter into the Einstein static universe by the us usual way okay so so we we just uh identify this part with uh, the with the pullback of the conformal embedding just let me just write this here okay so now where this diminutive tilde is uh, the metric of the einstein static universe as usual okay and now uh, we can again we just we, by doing that we, we have the the chi function the chi function which is of course the inverse and so it the zeros of the chi function enable us to obtain the the uh, conformal boundary well uh, well here the zeros uh, are clear okay so well right and well we have to do the usual procedure of picking up uh, a region which represents uh the, the our original space time which in this case is anti the sitter uh, and that region well, one of those possible regions is uh given by this condition okay right well i don't think i need to uh go into the full details because uh, we have already studied uh, the full details for Minkowski and the sitter but mm, so this is and so let me just uh, bring a picture of this conformal embedding Okay, so here we have the picture. Again, have to rescale the picture to fit it into the screen. Okay, so this picture, you see the Einstein, the, the cylinder representing the Einstein uh, static universe. And I have just uh, highlighted the region which represents our physical space time, which is anti the sitter which is given by this condition because well you remember the uh, circles which uh, represent uh, uh, s3 for of uh, the einstein static universe but the thing is that since we have this restriction we only are allowed to pick half of the circle okay because well remember that the complete circle is given by this restriction okay because this is the 
one of the polar angles of S3, but uh, our physical space-time is only uh, this is only a subset uh, defined by this relation. Okay, so this is just half of of the S3, and that's what we have here. Okay, so uh, well, um, cannot be perhaps seen well, but yeah, you see that this continues on the other side and we have uh, half of the S3 uh, and yeah indeed uh, well we can already see the shape of the conformal boundary which is uh, when chi here is equal to pi half okay so so both of these points are points such that chi is equal to pi half right and in that case well if we at the missing dimensions, we easily realize that the topology of the conformal boundary is uh, S2 cross R, okay, which is the corresponds to this vertical line. In this vertical line, each point has the topology of S2, okay, right. Uh, but what happens here? What happens is that uh, the region which we are have here in the Einstein static universe is a region such that its closure is not compact, okay? Because, well, this region uh, corresponds as always to the uh, image under the conformal embedding, okay? So it's this red region, but now we see in the picture that the closure of that region is not a compact set, okay? So this is So, okay, we have a conformal embedding as usual, but we don't have a conformal compactification. Is we, can we do something about it? Well, yes, it's possible indeed to find a conformal compactification of uh, uh, anti sitter but uh, as far as I know, not one, one ha cannot use for that Einstein static universe because uh, in this at least with these uh, transformations, we've, we didn't find a conformal compactification. Well, what we can do is, well, we can just uh, go back to, to where, to, to the expression of the metric we found, and we can just, well, do a further coordinate transformation, which uh, will enable us to find a conformal embedding of anti sitter into another uh, space time. Okay, so let us just take this and do another transformation. Okay, oh, sorry, I just didn't pick up all the metric. But anyway, we remember what was what is missing here. Okay, so just. Okay, so this is our expression of for the metric, and yeah, if we just take it and just introduce, well, because okay, the problem here is just the t is not uh, well, it doesn't vary within the, uh, the interior of a compact set, so we just have to uh, introduce another time coordinate to solve that problem. not very difficult as you you can see okay so now with this definition we find that uh, the new time tau, tau is varying within the interior of a compact set okay so now uh, it's very simple to find the new expression of the metric okay so mm, yeah well i don't know what if i should okay well i just write the final result because the intermediate computations are all 
elementary. I don't want to bother you, to, to bore you anymore with elementary algebra. Okay. Okay, so this is what we have now. And now with the restrictions, this was the restriction we found above. And now this is the restriction for the uh, tau uh, for the new time. Okay, well, in any case, well, uh, these restrictions come from the Mm, well, just to find by studying the zeros of the chi function, this new chi function. Okay, so right. Uh, okay. So so okay so so these these uh, values correspond to the uh, uh, well define the physical uh, space time which is ADS4, okay? Okay, but now, well, okay, yeah, we just look at, at, at the metric in, in within the round brackets. We see that, that this is not the Einstein static universe anymore, but we recognize a cosmological model, okay? We recognize a closed cosmological model because we have uh, here, uh, well, we have the, the the metric of the round uh, three sphere, and this corresponds to the scale factor, and this is the cosmological time. So, yeah, this is one of the. Uh, well, just keep, can write the generic metric of this of the cosmological model. Okay, and this uh, S3 is a uh, three metric. In our case, this is just the uh, three sphere. But well, you remember if you have uh, followed a cosmology course, this could be uh, uh, a flat uh, flat met flat metric in in three space, three what three three dimensional flat space. This could also be the uh, hyperbolic. Uh, space three-dimensional hyperbolic space so which corresponds to closed uh, models uh, flat models or open models okay so in uh, well we can just uh, give a picture of the cosmological model all right well here it is and have to again rescale picture. Okay. Right. Bit smaller. Okay. And so here in this uh, picture, we have that. Uh, well, uh, this corresponds to the. Big Bang. This is the big crunch, and each of these red sets are the three spheres. Okay, so uh, uh, well, no, sorry, sorry, no, it's not is. It's not the it's the boundary of the red set. Well, it's not. This is not. Uh, I should. I shouldn't have colored this uh, uh, in red. I should have colored in red only the boundary of this uh, set, because I mean, our universe, uh, the, the space, is not the interior of. It's just the 
the boundary. Okay, well, let me just. I mean, uh, yeah, this this has topology. Uh, well, we have uh, taken away uh, in this picture two dimensions, so we have a kind of uh, ellipsoid, but uh, only uh, it's it's just the surface of the ellipsoid which we are looking at here. Okay, and so when I said S three S three is not the interior is just the boundary. Um, this is just uh, only the the boundary. Okay, I should have taken that into account when I made the picture. But I hope that uh, my explanations make the point clear. Okay, and so yeah, and so well. Uh, We have uh, the chi polar angle, which is parameterized in this uh, circle. So uh, each value of chi corresponds to two different points on this uh, on the circle. Okay, right. And since uh, so, so this is the description of uh, the cosmological model. But uh, we're we we have done is that we have found a conformal embedding of anti sitter into the cosmological model, right? So now this uh, part of the metric uh, represents the conformal embedding. And now Jimmy Nutilda is, uh, well, is this uh, cosmological model, right? So in this case, Uh, if I if I take the case of uh, uh, of, of if I take the closed model, then now this corresponds to G mini tilde, right? Okay, and so now I just have to apply uh, the restrictions which define uh, ADS, which are these are the restrictions. So this, those restrictions imply that, uh, well, we just take chi equal to zero as this point. And so chi increases, this point is chi equal to pi, right? And so uh, we only have to consider uh, the region in which chi goes from zero to pi half. So this is chi equal to pi half and the other side chi equal to pi half. And so it means that we just have half of this ellipsoid. We only need to consider half of the ellipsoid. Okay. Well, mm, one has to, I hope that you underst understand my drawing. I mean, I cannot draw we really need to draw in three dimensions, but here I can only draw in two dimensions. So, but I hope that you understand that this is a three dimensional, well, it's like a rugby ball or, uh, and you are only taking, considering a uh, half of its surface, right? Which is represented like this. And okay, so uh, the boundary of the region is what I'm calling Scry, which is uh, now infinity, but now, uh, well, we only have, uh, well, we, we, we have to, uh, if we uh, regard, uh, well, if we regard uh, the points representing the Big Bang and the Big Crunch as uh, separate, so it, it turns out that the Scry has two components which is one of the components is the component on one side of, of the rugby ball. And the other component is the component on the other side of the rugby ball, which we cannot see with this perspective that we have to turn a bit the rugby ball to see the other component of the scribe. Well, uh, it's possible to achieve a two dimensional representation of this, which is, well, let me just, we'll draw it next to 
I mean, if we would be able to peel off, well, take away the surface of the rugby ball, which we are interested in, we could obtain something of this sort. Okay. Here we have two components of scribe, and then we have here these two points which in the cosmological model correspond to the Big Bang and the Big Crunch, but here we correspond to future uh, time like infinity and past time like infinity. Okay. And so this uh, region the interior. Uh, well, let me just draw the lines better for a reason for reasons which will become clear later. Okay, well, maybe sorry, I will just use the thinner pen. Uh, so the interior of this set corresponds to anti the sitter, right? So this is just uh, as always. Uh, um, the conformal embedding. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not with the med Sorry, let's just have to put it. Sorry about that. But I think you understand what I mean. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, and what are the properties now of, of this? What, how, how does this compare to, to the other cases which we uh, already uh, studied? Well, well, there are some properties which are easily visualized if we uh, look at the diagram uh, in the Einstein static universe, because here it might be a bit more difficult. Well, we just uh, came here, we just obtained this because in this case, well, it's easy to see that uh, for, 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 this conform for this conformal embedding, w it's easy to see that, well, maybe I, I will, okay. I'm going to use a different name for the conformal embedding here, mm, just not to confuse with the conformal embedding into the Einstein static universe. So this it turns out that this now is a compact set. So this is this, this small phi. I just let me just delete this. Put this small phi. This small phi is truly defines a conformal compactification of anti the sitter and and this conformal compactification enables us to uh, obtain uh, these additional points i plus and i minus which we couldn't see in the diagram obtained from the conformal embedding in the einstein universe the einstein static universe okay we could only see the uh, null, null infinity. So, yeah, so, so, so well, and that's an additional reason why I am uh, putting these two points in a separate fashion, okay? Well, and also we see that in the, at these two points, the conformal boundary is not smooth. We have, uh, well, because they correspond to the singularities of the cosmological model, okay? But well, uh, uh, there is a thing which is easier to see in the in this picture, and is the uh, the null rays, because well, we know how null rays are in the Einstein universe. Okay, so yeah, we see here. Uh, well, if if we just draw this in a two-dimensional picture, then we see the following. Okay. And maybe I can just put it here, right below. Uh, 
Okay, so yeah, we have we have here the null rays, which are straight lines at forty-five degrees. So, as always, the knowledge of the null rays will enable us to draw causal curves well, I mean, this should, this should be parallel but okay it's not easy to draw this but I think you understand what I mean okay and so yeah the thing is that uh, well we, if, w if we draw here a causal inextendable curve well we have to keep the slope of the curve between the uh, two null rays and well we find curves of, of uh, which never encounter the uh, scribe boundary this the the boundary defined with well I, I I think I I didn't set this during the lectures but uh, this is this letter is uh, sometimes referred to as scribe okay so that's why I'm using this Named Scry, which is uh, was the original. Well, I'm not sure how introduced this terminology. I don't know if the I think it was Penrose's original terminology, but I'm not sure. But anyway, it has become standard terminology, and I am also using it. Okay, so coming back to the diagram, we see that there are curves which never meet uh, the boundaries, and there are curves uh, which. Uh, start at the, at the boundary and end at the boundary okay so we have curves for well, let me just put it in black so for example we can draw a curve which starts at the point of scry and ends at the point of scry okay so so well maybe this is better seen the conformal compactification this we can see clearly if the different curves because he curves which don't meet uh, the boundary defined by scry will meet the boundary uh, defined at i plus and i minus so this uh, so what this also somehow justifies the terminology future time like infinity and past time like infinity because this there are time like curves uh, well only time like curves will end up in future in in, in in at this point but in these points null curves couldn't up as well okay well maybe this is okay we can i can well the null rays are examples null rays uh, cannot reach uh, the point oh, an array always have to start at the boundary at defined at one scribe and end up at another scribe right Another important property, which is easily seen in the representation in the Einstein universe, is that now scry are time-like hypersurfaces of the Einstein static universe. Okay. So. Uh, this is different to what we saw in the sitter and Minkowski. Remember that in the sitter, scry was null. In Min sorry, in Minkowski, scry was null. In the sitter, scry was space-like, and now here, scry is time-like. Okay, and we saw that this uh, this difference in the causal character of scry brings differences in the global structure of each space-time and yeah here the perhaps the the main uh, difference which uh, time like scribe brings is that ATS4 is not globally hyperbolic okay well this I mean I am not going to give you a formal proof of that fact 
but these uh, representations which we are have obtained by means of the conformal of the conformal embedding allows us to guess that this is the case why because well i think this is per perhaps this it's easier to see this here because we cannot find a hypersurface a special hypersurface which every causal inextendable curve has to meet okay because well if you just keep drawing space like hypersurfaces you always see that there are inextendable causal curves which don't meet uh, the hypersurface is somehow that well we can we can say that um, the existence of a time like scribe enables information to come up to, em to, to emerge from infinity constantly because in the other cases uh, new information couldn't come from infinity here the sky the, the time like character of the sky implies that we new information is coming up from infinity and so we cannot uh, put a space like curve which somehow uh, catches all the information which is coming from infinity okay well, it is just a heuristic argument but uh, somehow it conveys the essential idea okay mm. so so it in, in that sense anti-theater theater is, is very different to the other two uh space times because the other two space we saw that the other two space times are globally hyperbolic okay um okay so mm, uh yeah so so well we have uh, i think that the study of uh of uh the of, of conformal embeddings teaches us a great deal about the global properties of uh of 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 the simple solutions of the einstein equations so it's important to to know very well uh these diagrams and in fact, well, in, in the case of Antido Sitter, uh, well, it's it's uh, the well this uh, timeline character of uh, of the of the well the analysis of the, of the of, of of this conformal boundary has important implications in in, in in modern theoretical physics. Well, I'm not an expert in that field, so I cannot say much about it, but probably. All that you have heard about the Maldacena con conjecture and the ADS CFT correspondence. Well, okay, so the core of, of these uh, of these ideas is precisely uh, this analysis of the conformal embedding of the antidocitor into Einstein uh, static universe and the result that Scry is is timeline. Okay, so this uh, tells us that it's very important to know these, all these uh, in detail, okay? Right. Mm, and to finish this uh, study of the simplest solutions of, uh, of the Einstein equations, uh, well, uh, I, I said that uh, a lot of information can be obtained by, by just knowing the shape of, of the conformal diagram. So I'm just going, as a, as a matter of summary, I'm just going to draw here uh, the three diagrams of each of the uh, spaces, okay? So we have here, uh, oh, sorry. Yes. yes, this is just to summarize. Okay, let me just try to get no. Okay, it's now the straight line. Okay, so just to remind you this was Minkowski.
then we have the sitter and anti the sitter no, I'm just going to draw the, the conformal the conformal compactification okay well in these lectures we we restricted our study to dimension four but uh well of course these uh, simple solutions can be defined in any dimension and all these uh, well these results about the conformal diagrams are generalized to any dimension so i could uh, the, i could have uh, done our st uh, the study in dimension n or dimension d so, and then uh, well the results could have been the same okay what well, dimension of course uh, d greater than Okay, so in in, in, in any uh, of, the, of in any of these dimensions, the results are the same. So we could have obtained these sort of uh, diagrams, right? And well, you see that mm, uh, the shapes of the diagrams are different, and so that uh, implies different properties, different global properties of the space times, which have, we have already discussed. Okay, right. Okay, now mm, in the next lectures, we're going to uh, see what can be done for other solutions of the Einstein equations, which are not so simple. Okay, okay, so stay tuned and see you in the next lecture.